TED Talk entitled, The Story We Tell About Poverty Isn't True, has been viewed over 1.5 million times already. And she lives in Oakland. Mia? Hi. Thank you all for being patient. So there's this uh, after-school ritual I do with my children. Um, I started it because I got tired of the answer I'd get when they'd come home from school and I'd say, um, how was your day? And they would say what? Fine. I'd say, what did you do today? And they would say, exactly, yes, nothing. Um, <clears throat> so a few days before school started this year, um, a friend shared an article on Facebook called something like, the three questions to ask if you want to discover the secrets of your children's day. Um, and as you know, online headlines uh, are notoriously over-promising um, in an effort to get you to click, and I fell for it. And um, I read the article and I was totally impressed. And now after school, I ask my children these three questions and I'm getting all kinds of amazing insights into their days and how they're feeling. Would you like to know what they are? Yes. Okay. So the first question is, how were you kind today? This is a pretty easy one for them. I mean, they're not jerks. Uh, though I had my doubts about my son for the first couple of years. Um, so they tell me about how they talked to a new kid or helped the teacher or said something comforting to a friend. The second question is, how were you brave today? This one is a little harder because bravery um, seems really big, like jumping out of an airplane or climbing a mountain. So we have to talk a little bit about what everyday bravery looks like like raising your hand to ask a question when you think everyone else knows the answer, like um, trying a new activity or trying to master a skill that you feel like you're never gonna get the hang of. <clears throat> the third question is how did you fail today? Now, this one is really important if you're setting an expectation that your kids be brave because sometimes they're going to mess up. I want my kids to embrace failure, to see it as a kind of progress. I want them to understand that if they're not failing, they're not trying hard enough. They're not taking enough risks. And I don't mean being reckless, that's not bravery. I mean venturing outside their comfort zone. As theologian William Shedd said, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. So imagine going through this daily ritual with your children run a morally reprehensible fascist um, comes into power and begins to embolden hateful behavior and use his power to harm people who are already under attack. We start talking about other kinds of bravery. We talk about people who are locked up by ICE or the correction system and those folks starting hunger strikes. We talk about trans and gender non-conforming people who don't observe society's gender presentation norms, even if it means risking getting attacked. We talk about black women facing armed columns of police to assert that their lives matter. We begin to fine tune what being kind is to distinguish it from being nice. Niceness honors the comfort of others. It's being polite, whereas kindness sometimes means making people uncomfortable in order to do what's right. It means standing up on behalf of others to make clear that you won't tolerate sexism or racism or classism or homophobia, no matter how old, well-meaning, or powerful the guilty person is. And failure means sometimes you didn't show up for what was right. Sometimes you failed to follow your, your values. 
But we learn from failure. We strategize to think about how we can do better next time. <clears throat> so as you explore these questions with children, the other thing that starts to happen is you ask yourself these same questions. How am I being kind? How am I being brave? How am I failing? As adults, these questions take on a different significance, particularly in times that are demanding kindness and bravery, and where failure is inevitable but comes at a higher cost. These questions ask us to examine how closely we are living to our values and how well we are exercising our integrity in the face of circumstances that challenge us. So I want to tell you about my own failure. So I've spent much of my adult life pointing out the wisdom and resilience and tenacity, invention and connectedness of people who experience injustice. I've shared powerful stories about sisters who created a business together so they could care for their children while earning some money. A mom who went back to school and spends her evenings at the kitchen table doing her homework alongside her children while they do theirs. A dad who got his neighbors together to transform the empty lot across the street from his house into a community green space. Women who organize weekly van runs to take families from their communities to the prisons where their families and loved ones are locked up. But in telling these stories, I have drifted away from the actual problem. The systems that make this brilliance necessary are broken. I tell these stories of hard work, resilience, and creativity as a way of proving that people who are poor or black or queer or locked up are worthy and have value. But what I should be doing is interrogating the systems and institutions that demand that people prove that they are worthy of the things we are all entitled to. I first learned this lesson in 1999. The year before, I'd attended the first critical resistance con um, conference along with 3,500 other folks and was introduced to the phrase prison industrial complex. I learned that abolition was not done. I was activated, I was angry, and I was inspired. I went back to my home in Brooklyn and immediately became involved with an organization primarily run by ex-prisoners that, that they provided support groups and education services for folks coming out. Despite having zero teaching experience, I was given a writing class to run. My students were very patient with me, and I soon realized that they had way more to teach me than I had to teach them, and frankly, it was ridiculous that they were expected to learn anything from me. In that class, I learned that the distinctions people in power make between us and them are lies that the distinctions between those who deserve support and benefit and trust and those that don't are really just shoring up the existing power structures by pitting us against each other. And we see this all the time, right? It's in the respectability politics that reward black people who manage to slip through the barriers racism creates to success. It's in the messaging about hardworking immigrants and it's in the rhetoric about violent versus nonviolent offenders. Here is what I want all of us to learn and relearn and believe for ourselves and for each other. Our worthiness, our value as human beings is intrinsic to our very existence. No one should have to demonstrate their value in order to be awarded the ability to live. No one should have to prove their worth to claim their right to live a life of dignity. None of us should have to worry about having enough food or a safe place to live or how we're going to access a quality education for ourselves or our children. None of us should worry that seeking help for a health problem is going to put us in debt for decades. None of us should have to struggle alone with depression or trauma. Each of us deserves the access to the things that allow us to live just for being born into this world. Even many of us that understand the multitude of oppressions that continue to privilege some and create obstacles for others still believe that one can overcome by working harder and trying more and being better. 
I mean, we have examples, right? President Obama, Oprah, Laverne Cox. But these people are exceptions, and exceptions can be an example for our aspirations, but they should never be our standard. I want us to keep breaking ceilings and busting down walls, but we also need to demand that systems change to keep us all safe and well, so that when we lose a job or get sick or grow our families or go back to school, we aren't left struggling for our lives and facing impossible decisions. A couple of months ago, I spent three days on land in the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. The land used to be a plantation. I was there with a group of about 20 people, <clears throat> and we learned um, on the first day that the former owner of the plantation and his two sons were notorious for raping and impregnating the enslaved black women on that plantation and the surrounding plantations. So on that night, I gathered up the six other black people that were there, and we walked out into the cold, into a field where we circled up beneath the branches of two trees to pay homage to our ancestors. We held hands, we drank from a communal cup, and we poured libations to honor those who came before us. And we looked up into the star bright sky, and we were all struck by the fact that although the land had surely changed, since there were enslaved people working it, that sky was the same. When I'm facing the kind of challenge and adversity or injustice that makes my breath shallow or wakes me at night, I often think about my ancestors. I think about all they survived and created so that I could be standing right here. They crossed oceans, they physically labored under brutal conditions, they were separated from loved ones, they were beaten. They brought food and gods from the motherland to here. They invented new music and art to celebrate and to mourn. They fashioned life and conjured family, and they dreamed me into existence. I know that if they didn't believe we could be free, that we'd still be enslaved. I know from them that no great power is permanent or immovable. I know from them and from my lived experience with my own family and community that the only way we move forward is together, not with silent tolerance or without conflict, but with struggle and examination and love. From Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which contains nearly infinite wisdom, I know that we are caught in an inescap inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that was part of what my students taught me. Despite America's attempts to separate us from each other through bondage, through forced migration, through prisons, through capitalism, through words and messages, we are interdependent, and we have never, and will never, get anywhere alone. And my God, why would we want to? What joy would there be in progress or success or building a life without the company of loved ones? I'm gonna leave you with this. So Dennis Scott, who was one of the most significant um, poets writing in early, post-independence Jamaica, um, he also was my uncle, um, wrote this. For the blessed, it comes in the act of loving. A cry of birds hoping south, a perfect sentence, sudden as candlelight's leap at my wife's mouth, comes at any moment that will reassert the permanence of dreams, the possibility of dancing. Since there is no armor, but the festivals we make, hand over hand, the hearts drum louder than any sound of soldiers falling. Till the war is over, let us celebrate ourselves, all that is kind and carnival, living without goodbyes, without acquiescences of grief of ending, that small victory only. Thank you.
Um, thank you. So I also want to say, um, you know, I was asked, I'm going to start crying. Um, I was asked to come here to like provide some inspiration. But of course, what I've experienced over the last two days is me being inspired. So just as my students in 1999, I was asked to come teach them. I didn't teach them nothing, maybe some grammar. Um, but they really taught me like deep life lessons. And part of the work that I do continues to be um, telling stories um, about how we all do family. How our families that are seen as broken, are seen as dysfunctional, are full of connection and love and ways of transcending space and time to maintain togetherness. So I'm here. Yesterday, I interviewed several of you. Um, I'm going to be out in the hall after I'm done talking. If any of you want to now or later share your stories of family with me, I would be honored to listen to them. So I just want to say that I'm happy to interview you. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next panel. We have, um, we have representatives from Career Institute here at Merritt College and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, and CEO Works for a panel on employment. Answering that question that so many people come out of prison or jail or out of college asking, what do I need to know to find the right job? All right, hey y'all, I'm Dom Taylor, staff attorney for Root and Rebound. Got a lot of feedback, and I will be moderating this panel. It's entitled Employment, What You Need to Know to Find the Right Job. And we want this to be a very open, honest dialogue, and we have a very, very good panel who I'm excited to hear from. So I'm just gonna kick it off with having everybody introduce themselves. Um, just your name, your organization, a little bit about your uh, experience and some of the work the work that you do. And we'll start off with Joanna from Leaders Up. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanna Martinez, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programs and Training for Leaders Up. Um, I will be speaking from that pre-employment perspective, but also from the perspective of being a program manager at Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency um, in my previous role there. Um, so I'll be speaking from both perspectives. Uh, that program was a reentry um, centered pre-employment program. My name is Cicely Winston. I'm the Career Service Specialist here at the uh, Career Institute and Job Center here at Merritt College. We're located in the D Building, Room 178. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Vernon Royal. I'm the Program Coordinator for Center of Employment Opportunity. We are located here in Oakland. We are a um, transitional job training program for the formerly uh, incarcerated, as well as for individuals between the ages of 18 to 35 who are city of Oakland residents. So we offer transitional job services that offer you a full-time uh, full positions. That is our uh, ultimate goal. So you start off in a transitional job setting where you pay daily, and we have employers set up who will hire you in full-time positions with your criminal background. So thank you. I'm Andrea Richardson. I'm the policy director with Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. Um, and we work on, we, through advocacy and organizing, work to release incarcerated people, restore civil and human rights to the people who've been incarcerated and unify families. Um, and we center the leadership of formerly incarcerated formerly incarcerated people um, and have worked historically on ban the box measures. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elias Gonzalez. I come from the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. We are located in Watsonville, California, which is the strawberry capital of the world. Um, and I've been working in and out of custody, working with juveniles and adults, f presently focused with AB 109 populations coming back from incarceration, um, and we focus around employment. All right, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. And we're gonna sort of, um, we have a lot of experience up here, so I'm gonna, I have a couple prepared questions for each of the panelists that I'll ask, but I definitely wanna leave a lot of time for Q&A from the audience and get it, um, get a little bit of interaction going. 
But to start, we're going to start off with Vernon from CEO Works, which is based here in Oakland. Um, well, his office is in Oakland. And um, so Vernon, you y'all work with folks who are fresh, freshly released, people who they're released back in the community, go into the parole office, and you are right there from day one. From your work on the ground, what are you seeing that folks are needing from the very beginning and their first days out, and what information should they know? Um, one of the first things that uh, most indiv individuals get when they return home from being incarcerated is the first thing is the PAC meeting, which is a parole and community action team meeting, where they must report to the parole office that they are being released to. Um, upon them coming to that meeting, they, may, they are made aware of the community-based organization services that are available to them, the things that they are going to need to um, receive these services. Everyone, when they first come home, must get I-9 documentation in order to get any type of employment anywhere. So this means a Social Security card and a California ID. Um, most of the parole offices here in the Bay Area, they're able to assist them with getting that ID and we assist them with on how to get their social security information. Because in order to get, like I say, a job anywhere, and especially um, to be in a situation where you're not gonna be harassed by law enforcement continuously, you must have an ID. Because law enforcement can harass you just because. So first things first is uh, helping them get their I-9 documentation, and that's through parole services. Okay, excellent, excellent. So of course, what we see is like, there's a lot of physical things like an ID, um, driver's license, uh, housing, shelter, but there's also a lot of um, intangible things that can't really be quantified, but that I think are absolutely necessary, particularly when we're talking about finding jobs. Um, so I'm gonna kick it over to Elias now. And when we're, uh, when we're talking about folks who are just come home to the community, you know, they spent time away, but that doesn't mean they don't have experiences. Oftentimes you learn a lot of things while, during incarceration and before incarceration that prepare you to be a phenomenal entrepreneur or worker when you get back. So just I want you to kick some knowledge about how folks can translate their, their street skill set and all the lessons they've learned on their journey into uh, marketable job, uh, job uh, qualifications. Thank you. Um, I like to, at our agency, we have a strength-based approach. Um, we focus on the strength of the individual, um, whatever the individual may be an expert in. Um, we focus on that. Um, I am big on character development. I believe character development is a foundation. Um, we can teach you the hard skills at work, um, but those soft skills that people come with um, is something that is ideally taught at home. And if it's not taught at home, you know, we try to teach some of those lessons. Um, there's a lot of teachings. Um, there's a lot of things that we've learned in the streets um, previously to being incarcerated. I mean, cash handling experience. Uh, we've been leaders within the community, we've been, we're professionals, so we're, we have honesty, we have integrity. Uh, problem solving skills, um, you get a young man out of the, in, in the community and they're gonna figure out how to solve that problem. So we have problem solving capabilities, we have so many teamwork, I mean these are things we're learning in the neighborhoods. We go to prisons, we're learning how to become professionals, how to conduct ourselves at a professional level, how to communicate effectively. These are the skills that any employer is going to seek. Um, as, I mean, and the one that I especially connect to is having a palabra. In other words, having a word. Um, it goes back to loyalty. It goes back to values. Um, having a palabra in general for me is the basic principles and the first step of the rites of passage curriculums, um, which a lot of our men has unfortunately not had at home for missing parents just like myself. I learned a lot of things about being a man in the streets, unfortunately. And surely enough, as I got older and life lessons came my way, um, I learned what a true man is. So the first concept I try to focus with all the participants is focus on their character strengths. What are your strengths? What are you good at? And let's start focusing from that expert. And let's start bringing up those dreams. What did you dream about being in third grade? Fireman, police officer, whatever. Some of those, of course, they won't be able to attain no more, but let's see what we can do with them. Let's start with their dreams and their aspirations and let's try to get them to where they wanna be. Excellent, excellent. And now I'm gonna have, uh, so Joanna, like just taking into consideration everything that Elias just said, um, you, I know you work with folks, you have a lot of experience working with folks in reentry. Um, in addition to being able to uh, utilize the skill sets and all the capital that you bring to the table, 
what other sorts of uh, skills, whether it's communication or anything else, um, do you work, uh, help folks to sort of utilize that leaders up and prepare them for uh, finding jobs? So I definitely have to agree um, with, with Elias, is it? Yeah. Yes. Transferable skills are key with this population. Um, hustle is one of them. So at, through Leaders Up, we teach um, perseverance and grit, right, which we don't really have to teach this population much of that. They already have enough perseverance and grit. If they've gone through prison or jail and came out and still are alive, they have perseverance and grit. We just have to frame, help them frame it in a way that markets themselves, um, that helps them market themselves to employers. Another thing that I would add also, so we touched on you know, the barriers, the, the identification, the tangible um, barriers that are there and the tangible uh, methods of, of opening up some doors. We talked about some soft skills development as well. We also have to make a business case to the employers for them to understand what is in it for them. Businesses, corporations, are businesses and corporations. Their bottom line is to make profit. But as more and more we move into a movement against you know, the current administration, um, a lot of organizations and companies and industries are also thinking about the bottom line in terms of corporate social responsibility. So that's another kind of selling point or marketing point that we need to actually build out as a unit, as, as, as a united front uh, with the CTE programs at Peralta Community Colleges, uh, with the community-based organizations that are doing workforce development, and with the organizations that are kind of in, in the middle, like a talent development intermediary um, that serves um, folks in a way that kind of Reverse, reverse engineers the process of hiring. So for example, we start, Leaders Up for example, starts with the employer's needs. We build out a robust pipeline to the employer by identifying the needs, then we train, we recruit, then we train individuals to fit those needs. We also connect individuals with um, uh, education opportunities so that they can actually gain stackable credentials. That is one of the mitigating factors of uh, the negative um, factors of having a criminal background is no credential, no high school diploma, no GED. Once you are able to market yourself in a way that you let the employer know, I'm actually improving myself. This is what happened. This is how I paid for my you know, crime or whatever. And this is what I learned from it. But beyond that, this is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm involved in now. And so I think, you know, to kind of go with, um, the, the keynote speakers sort of, I want to dovetail on that, we need to come as a united front and we need to develop a robust support network for these individuals. We cannot do it alone. And we also need to make a business case to local employers and to large corporations. Federal tax bond, bonds, federal tax credits, uh, federal bonds exist since the 1960s. And we are not really schooled up on that. And we're definitely not really schooling up our participants on how to use that as a marketing tool when they go to these interviews with employers. And I think um, I really like how you were able to talk about all the other programs, whether it's workforce development, um, community college systems. Like, if there's anything that I want y'all to be able to take away today and from yesterday, it's that nobody's alone. If you're in Rancher, you're like, you're not in this alone. Your family isn't alone. There's plenty of resources right here in the Bay Area. A lot of folks working hard to create equitable access to jobs and higher ed. Um, and on that note, I'm going to ask you next, Cicely. Um, I know you're over right here at the brand new Career Institute at Merritt College. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing and what career services can do for uh, students more generally? Okay, well, as you all know, the Career Institute and Job Center opened up in January the 26th. And we offer a wide range of uh, workshops on a weekly basis, ranging from everything from career exploration using ONET. We help the community members identify what it is that their interests are and try to help them align their interests and their natural talents up with uh, sectors in, out in the industry. We also offer um, organizing yourself for maximum job search results. We help them identify and get all the information together that they need to fill out their resumes, to fill out job applications. Um, we also offer professionalism in the workplace. We um, teach them what it's like to work in a professional environment. 
whatever questions that they have that may come up. They may have never been in a professional environment before. We meet them where it is that they are and help them develop the skill set, the knowledge to know how to conduct themselves and adapt in a, a professional environment. We also offer resume writing and interview skills. And WIOA, I'm the WIOA Sector Access Specialist, and I work personally with reentry clients. They're my priority of service to give them intensive one-on-one -on -one case management services to help them find job training and get job placement. Excellent. What does WIOA stand for? Could you break uh, that down for us a little yeah. bit? Uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Program. There we go. All right. And Andrea, so we've talked a lot about um, some of the barriers, whether it's identification or how to market yourself to employers. But sort of on a macro level, what are some of the structural barriers that we see in our society that formerly incarcerated folks are uh, facing? And why is it, what, what are employers using as their justification for not giving jobs to folks with records? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, so what we see, what I've seen um, working on trying to reduce certain barriers to employment is there are, there's kind of a mismatch between the existence and the scope of structural barriers that are actively preventing people from getting jobs and then an awareness of those structures and awareness of the scope of those structures, which I think frequently goes hand in hand, right? Like if a system or system of structures is in place so firmly, it actually becomes harder to see kind of the bigger that structure is. Um, so I, I mean, just in terms of numbers, in California, up to nine out of 10 employers perform background checks on people. Um, and that's in California, I don't know how many people are familiar with the ban the box law that passed in California in 2013. Um, it was AB 218, um, it's in the labor code now, and it prevents public employers, so that's like a, a small sliver of employers in California, it prevents public employers from doing a background check um, or, or from asking about your conviction history on the initial application materials. But what does that, that leaves literally any other point in time in the application process for public employers to ask, and private employers can ask whenever they want, um, and most do. So that's one big um, jungle of stuff that <laughs> hurts people, um, is that this is a practice that's very widespread and it's very commonplace for employers to think that this is just the norm, right? That you, of course, you are going to run a background check on someone, you're going to look at their conviction histories. Um, and when you're doing that, you're probably drawing on some kind of narrative about what it means to have a criminal history. And that narrative is probably telling you something like, oh, it's really rare, only really bad people have conviction histories, people I don't wanna hire, um, people I don't wanna have anything to do with. And so that kind of runs up against the other structural problem, which is one out of three adults in California alone have a conviction history or an arrest record. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that you can't, it's actually, a, it's, it's a mistake, it's inaccurate to think about convictions as something that aligns with like individual accountability or um, can tell you anything about a person other than that, oh, maybe we have a problem in this state and in this country where so many adults have conviction histories. Um, but so I think that those two numbers kind of represent the, the um, big outline of structural problem um, and barriers that people with convictions face. One is that most employers do background checks. Two is that many people um, in California have convictions. And I guess the third is that there's not across California a robust process for um, how employers should be able to consider those conviction histories that takes into account um, how widespread conviction histories are and how 
they're not actually very informative of any kind of data that would, would actually be useful to you as an employer. Um, so that data being, is this person suitable for the job? Um, are they going to be a good employer? Are they reliable? Are they gonna get along well with everyone else working there? Um, conviction history is not really gonna tell you that information. Um, so those things, and the lack of awareness around those things means that um, there's, there's not really what we lack, I think, in California, and what we're moving towards, and what organizations like LSBC and All of Us or None um, are, have been working towards is kind of creating uh, a narrative about the systemic problem um, that sort of tries to highlight and bring awareness to the fact that so many people have conviction histories. This is more about a structural problem in terms of how we police, how we arrest, how we incarcerate people um, than about individual responsibility or accountability. Um, and I guess the last barrier is that that narrative hasn't fully taken hold yet um, in policymakers, in employers, um, because still, um, when you sort of talk to employers, when you talk to some policymakers about increasing um, protections for people who have conviction histories, um, which I'll talk about maybe a little bit later, a lot of the questions still are, well, shouldn't employers be able to not hire someone with conviction history? Isn't that their right? Isn't it dangerous? Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done about it giving people greater, giving employers, I think also, and um, people applying for jobs, greater access to an alternative, alternative narrative. Excellent, and I'm gonna sort of, this will be a question open up to all the panelists, but I sort of wanna dig in a little bit deeper into some of what Andrea was saying. Um, so we see that there are these larger structural issues in place, a lot of them, I mean, just like stating the facts that we know, some of our communities are policed more than others, oftentimes black and brown communities, LGBT communities, we have higher incarceration, incarceration rates because we're interacting with law enforcement more and there's a lot of narratives going out, or out there about uh, presumptions of dangerous and uh, black and brown people being more dangerous than other people, for example, and presumptions of guilt in the criminal courtroom. As advocates working to find folks meaningful, lasting jobs, what can we do given the context of it's 2017 and our country is where it's at, what can we do to push back against these narratives and really fight for inclusiveness and equity, get jobs for people in reentry? Like what can we be doing in our daily lives? Um, the thing that we do as CEO, which makes our program a really unique program and a successful program is that we offer a transitional job. So within three days of life skills classes, uh, these individuals are put to work. And they have one day where they still come in and they receive job development skills. Well, we work with them on their resume building, their interview skills and techniques. We work with them on setting up an email address. We work with them on all the things that they're gonna need to be a, a gainful employee for a, a big time company. Um, we have received money from big time companies such as Google, Amazon companies of this nature who have come in and supported our program and who actually have hired from our program. And they come in and do hiring events for us. Um, we have a contract with Caltrans where, um, and CDCR where each day our uh, guys who have been to prison, they go out and they work on the highway and they do litter abatement on the highway. And they're paid every day at a pay rate of twelve eighty six an hour. Uh, Caltrans came in two weeks ago and did a hiring event because Caltrans is felony friendly. And a lot of people don't know this. So they came in and they did a, a hiring module for us and I believe 16 of our guys got invited to the next step which is taking the testing. Because it's usually about a one to two year process to get hired in a, in a position like this. Um, so with our program, we are ensuring employers that these people are employable and that they are ready to take full time employment by them being in a transitional job setting which is really key in what an employer wants to see. They want somebody who's reliable. And where is there more structure than prison besides the military? And these are some of the things that we work with, with our participants on. You're coming from a structured society. Each day you're in prison, you know what you're gonna do. 
You know at what time you're going to eat. You know what time you're going to go to sleep. You know what time you're going to get up. So that's the same setting that we have in our transitional job. They have to be at work at our warehouse at 6.30. They know they're going to have lunch at 12.30. They're going to get off at 2.30. That's what an employer wants to see. And that's what we work with them on with their life skills when they come into our program. And me coming from that population myself, I real feel really fortunate to be able to do this type of work, to work with the population that I was once a part of and I still consider myself a part of. And so it, it's kind of like, you know, if you, like they say, if you haven't been there, you, doesn't know, you don't know what it's like to be there. You know, and I can instill that into my participants, and our program does that. So we, have, we had a hiring event today at our job, so we're actually working with employers who are actually coming to our work site, coming to our offices, and hiring right on the spot. And we, what we do is we screen our participants. We find out who's a good fit for this position. When they come into our program, we do an assessment. An assessment usually takes about five to six weeks, because we want to match them with their skill set. We have individuals who are working at Tesla now who were lifers in prison. For 25 years, they worked in PIA making and doing upholstery, sewing clothes, things of this nature. So we work with them to let them know any of their relevant prison history is a great resume. And when we help them put that resume together, your resume doesn't say you worked at San Quentin Prison in Temecula, California. It says you worked for the state of California for seven years, and this is what you did. If you can do that for 12 cents an hour, why can't you come home and go to work for $14 an hour? Plus, when you receive benefits, that may be another 3 to $4 per hour that you are receiving. So, you know, we work with the employers to, to let them know and understand that we are giving you a commodity that's really going to be an asset to your company. Because of the fact it takes a lot of work to build a bridge with an employer to get them to want to trust this population. And so when you do get them to trust your population, you want to make sure you're, you're giving them what they're asking for. You know, and, and you're going to have some failures, true enough. But if you encourage them and you work with them and help them to recognize that they're doing this for themselves and their family, they tend to do a lot better. So that's what we do. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> as I stated earlier, I'm big on palabra, so I believe that um, educating the participants that come our way on character development traits are big. Uh, I deal mostly with males coming back from prisons. Uh, a lot of the participants that we work with are individuals that had missing parents, had missing, you know, missing families. So the reality is that the neighborhoods were our families. Um, we learned a lot of things from the neighborhood. I tell people, we learned a lot of positive things, but we didn't really focus on those things. Um, I have some basic principles, and I come with another, I do it's, uh, the concept of la cultura cura. Um, culture cures, um, it's our foundation, it's what we do, and I have some basic teachings here that I try to teach the men, and the first teaching, like I said, is having a palabra. If we go into the community and we have a, you know, the trauma, the homelessness, the, all the barriers that we're dealing with, it's easily, we can easily be triggered. So I think for me, I try to instill basic concepts with the men that we work with us, having a palabra, having a word, um, having a sense of responsibility of your own well-being and those of others, um, rejecting any form of abuse, physically, emotionally, mental, or spiritual, to yourself and to others, um, taking time to reflect and pray, um, and including ceremony in your life, um, se being sensitive and understanding, um, being a mirror and reflecting support and clarity to one another. This is what we come up as men in the community. We have to be mirrors to our young men. Um, if they look around and all they see is gangs, violence, and that behavior, then the reality is that that's what they're gonna lead to. We need to be examples. We need to be models, and the reality is that it lands on us. I look around and I think I see a lot of service providers, so I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, it boils down to being the lead. I mean, being the example to our communities, and at the day, they, leaving these values, like I said, it's not just a way of life, it's leaving these values honestly and with love, and showing the men, and telling the men, you know what, I have love for you. The, where they may have never heard something like that, like, whoa. You know, and I go into jail and I meet a man and I say, I love you. And he's like, well, I'm not gay. Well, I'm not gay either, but it's okay. You know, I got no worries. I, I, you know, but I have love for people. I was taught at a very young age. I went to Mexico, met my great grandmother, and at the age of actually six or so, she came up to me and said, hey, Miko, Miko, how I love you. I love you so much. I remember looking at her and saying, you don't know me. I've never known you. How can you love me? And I'm thinking that in my head. 
I think now that I'm a little bit older, I understand the concept of unconditional love. So I think just knowing me, I was a, re a connection to her, and I think that's what for me is. It's that connection with the community, it's the connection with the people. And if they feel that when they come in, everything, uh, getting the job is the easy part. So getting to school is the easy part. If we can do all this other work. So I think building the connection, building the relationship where they're feeling valued, and they're reminded that they are a gift. The people in our community are a gift. We've been told we are thugs, we are violent, we are all these labels that the community has, but we are a gift. So I remind everybody that you are a gift. Definitely, appreciate that. And we have about, I think about 12 minutes left, so I'm gonna give everybody, starting with Joanna, just about 60 seconds to just quickly uh, state like what you, whatever it is that's on your mind, <laughs> like straight up, just like whatever's on your mind related to creating jobs, finding jobs, whatever it is. Um, and then I wanna kick it to the audience for more questions. So in 60 minutes, I'll delineate a five-step approach, structural approach um, to remove barriers with employers and with employment for this population. So one, vet the employers and create direct pipelines to the employment opportunities by making the business case to add value to the bottom line of the employers. Um, two, well three, create op apprenticeship opportunities with the employer like CEO is doing, like Leaders Up is doing, like Boss is doing, like a lot of organizations are doing. Um, on the job training, and four, work with the direct line supervisors of these employers to ensure that they understand the barriers that this population may face. For example, a person may have to go to meet their probation officer. That's a barrier, right, in the employer's mind. That may not be a barrier. If the individual's meeting their requirements with probation, that's not a barrier for the actual employee, but that may be a barrier for the employer. So developing a um, systematic case conferencing with the direct line employers may require a little more footwork, um, but it's definitely necessary. And we have the expertise to actually train the frontline em employers to live up to the expectations that they have of their employees, especially when it comes to this population. And then finally, um, establish a support complex. Just like we're battling the prison industrial complex and hyper-incarceration, we need to also, again, collaborate in spite and despite financial resources because those things are gonna be cut pretty soon. Um, we need to collaborate and leverage each other's resources and expertise. Thank you. Um, I would say each one teach one. Um, I'm not just a career service specialist here Monday through Friday. That's what I do 24-7. I have professional growth and development, personal growth and development. I share this information with neighbors, friends, cousins, whoever I encounter, whatever resources and information I have. I make sure if it fits them and their criteria, they know what it is that they need to do, where to go, and if I can help them, I do it. Um. I would like to say that um, at CEO, due to the Measure Z money, which was a bond initiative here in the city of Oakland, we're able to service 18 to 35 year olds from the city of Oakland who are not on probation or parole, but are at risk of becoming on probation or parole. They can come into our program and join a transitional job, receive the same training, and get placed in full-time employment as well. So our program is just not for offenders, it's for individuals between the ages of 18 to 35 who are at risk of becoming an offender. So we want to step in early and, and help them not become an offender. Let's get them on the right track in the beginning. So we offer that as well, and I have flyers and things and cards to hand out. You may know someone who fits that criteria. So thanks. Um, and uh, what we would say is advocate for different structures. Um, try to change the policies. And one way that you can do that um, is supporting a bill that we're sponsoring this year, AB 1008. Um, it's our Ban the Box bill for California, Ban the Box Revised. And it would make, um, it, would make it so that all employers in California, all, so public and private, would not be able to consider a background, um, a con someone's conviction history until after an initial conditional offer has been made to that person. Um, so that means that employers have to look through a person's application materials, conduct an interview, in other words, get to know that person as an individual 
before even um, starting, con to starting to consider any convictions they might have. Um, it also codifies that employers can't consider any conviction history older than seven years, um, and that's a partial law in California already, private background check companies can't report, aren't supposed to report information that's older than seven years, um, but this bill would sort of confirm that employers can't use any information that they even happen to somehow Google or find out. Um, and it would require employers who, once they've made an, made an initial offer, and if they do decide to run a background check, it would um, require employers to consider the position that the person is applying for, the age of that person's conviction, and the relationship between the conviction and that position. So this would encourage employers not to have just blanket bans saying, you know, we, just, we don't hire people with convictions. Um, or, you know, we are not gonna hire anyone with any drug convictions or anyone with any theft convictions for any position. Um, this would say that, you know what, you can't do that. You have to make an individualized assessment. Um, and then third, it, it includes all of these provisions under the Fair Employment and Housing Act in California, which um, means that if you are a person who's applying for a job and you're denied based on a conviction, you have um, all of the remedies that are included in the Fair Employment and Housing Act at your disposal um, to bring an appeal to an enforcement agency, ultimately all the way up to potentially being able to sue that employer if they wrongfully deny you a job. Um, and so, right, these would become laws that offer protection to people, but also um, would ho hopefully help to change that narrative um, by encouraging employers to really look at people's convictions as individual people rather than as um, some monolithic group. Um, I think what I want to say is that we've got to realize that employment is a community effort. Um, it's not just up to the individual. Um, there's so many things, barriers that the participants are already dealing with. Um, as a family, let's be a supportive system. Let's be a circle to this participant. We are involved in so many cycles that sometimes when we come home, I remember my mom, literally, my mom, I would say something or I did something and my mom would say, otra vez Elias? And that would break my heart. She never knew it, but basically what did it mean? Again, Elias? And FYI, only my mom calls me Elias, and I feel I'm in trouble when I hear Elias. Um, <laughs> I only hear it, I call myself Elias. But the reality is that we want to reinforce, and we got to be careful with what we tell the people that are coming back. We got to be very careful with the, those words we use, because trauma is there with our communities. And we try to, we have to support and heal the people that are coming back into our communities and welcome them with open arms. They are people, they are fathers, they are wanting to make it happen. So I, my deal is always, let's remind them of their strength. And as I see Huey up there, I think as he spoke here, I think I, he mentioned something about knowing our strengths, knowing our enemies, and knowing our supporters. Let's know what we're really good at. Let's know what our keys are. Let's know what we are strong at. Let's also know those areas of improvement. Let's know what we can improve. And I've learned not to call people weak in prison. You know, we call it, we say areas of improvement because we all have them. All of us have areas of improvement. So let's find out what those areas of improvement are and let's find out who's supporting us. Who is really there? We sometimes we think the people in our neighborhood are supporting us, but unfortunately, I love them to death, but my neighborhood isn't as supporting me. You know, unfortunately, they're supporting me in some of the negative aspects. But let's find out who those true supporters, who that real circle around you is, and let's have the participants find that out and help them guide them in the process. Definitely. Appreciate it. And we're about out of time. So actually, instead of audience questions, I'm going to just uh, allow everyone to quickly say how we can follow up with you. I know, I think everybody has a table at the back, but website, how to follow up, anything like that. Yeah, so uh, Leaders Up again, and our table is right over there with the uh, gray banner, and 
Um, you can email me directly, come and chat with me. So one of the beautiful things that Leaders Up does is that we don't just prepare folks for the interview and all the other processes needed to get a job. We actually guarantee the job, and we actually guarantee the interview with all of the employers that we vet and we work with. Um, so that's a direct pipeline right there. Um, as I mentioned before, we're located here at Marin College in the D building, room 178. I have um, uh, workshop calendars outside at the table, along with some giveaway bags. No, we're here to serve the community. Uh, CEO Works, we're located at 464 7th Street, downtown Oakland. We are directly across the street from the Oakland Police Office. We're right next door to Bad Boy Bell's Bond. So our participants have a unique situation. It's like they come and they're like, hey, man, is this a setup? You know, and I'm like, no, nah, it's not a setup, buddy. It's, a, it's the real deal. So um, our website is ceoworks.org. I also have some flyers with me, and I have some of my business cards. But like I said, our program is a very unique program, and it's very successful. So like I said, I encourage anyone here who knows anyone between the ages of 18 to 35 that lives here in the city of Oakland. They don't have to be in trouble to get these services. And like I said, we guarantee a transitional job immediately after three days. Guaranteed. Thank you. Um, the best way to get in touch with us, I think you can find all of our information on our Facebook page, Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. Um, and you can get in touch with all of us or none, our, pro our sister project, and find information for our fifth annual Quest for Democracy, which is on May 8th. It's our annual Lobby Day, Advocacy Day for formerly incarcerated people in Sacramento. Um, again, it's May 8th, and all that information is on our Facebook page for legal services for prisoners with children. And I actually come with the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. We are in, on www.cabinc.org. And I also have business cards. Don't have a table, but if you wanted to connect with me, I do have some business cards. All right. Thank you to each of our panelists. We can get a large round of applause for them. <laughs>